right, so I think we can start. Oh, there is some echo, but okay, it's not too bad. All right, so before beginning, uh, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand and I'll bring you the microphone because otherwise people online will not be able to hear anything. Maybe I will bring you another microphone because of the echo. Okay, so without further ado, it's a pleasure to have Julian today. We will talk about uh, a fair comparison of uh, Hubble tension solving models. Thank you very much. So I apologize because this is a week on gravitational waves and my talk will not be about gravitational waves, but about the, the Hubble tension. Um, it's, uh, it will mainly follow a work we did recently with uh, Neil Schoenberg, Guillermo Franco Bellan, Andreas Perez Sanchez, Samuel Witty, and Vivian Poulin. So when I speak to a non-specialized audience, not like you, I usually start from stressing that we have a well-established robust uh, standard cosmological model, which relies on many pillars like these observations from the Planck satellite, for instance, but not only. So when we, when we fit uh, our Lambda CDM minimal cosmological model to uh, Planck, we have a very good six parameter fit to about 5,000 independent points and this best fit is very consistent with a number of other experiments. So that's very reassuring and we don't want to throw away Lambda CDM all at once. Sorry. <laughs> okay, and we have to stress, of course, that experiments like the CMB or the other experiments uh, mentioned here are not direct measurement of the Hubble rate, as you know. For instance, the CMB will mainly measure uh, six quantities. You can argue a few more, but mainly the density ratio of baryons to photons of total non-relativistic to relativistic matter, the scale of the sound horizon, to which we'll come back with, it will play a, a very important role today, and parameters uh, related to the primordial spectrum of fluctuations and the time of rayonization. And it's only indirectly, once you have fixed all these quantities that within the Lambda CDM model, you do get the measurement of the Hubble rate, which is of the order of 60.67 kilometer per second per megaparsec with an error bar, which depends on the data set, but is of the order of 1%. Okay, uh, in order to get a direct measurement of H0, you need to use uh, the measurement of cosmological distances, in particular, the luminosity distance from, uh, for instance, from supernovae. And for that, you do a Hubble diagram of luminosity versus redshift. In the old days, people were mainly interested in the curvature of this curve. By using very uh, high redshift supernovae, you can have access to the curvature, marginalizing over the, over the first derivative. Imagine you do a Taylor expansion of this, um, of this function. Uh, the curvature is, is, or the second uh, derivative will give you a measurement on the acceleration of the universe and the spatial curvature of the universe. And this is what brought the Nobel Prize to uh, Ries and Perlmutter. But now the same people, in particular Adam Ries and collaborators, and also many other groups in the world, are interested in focusing on the first derivative. And the first derivative is really giving you a measurement of the Hubble tension. So for these people use relatively nearby supernovae, they use a distance ladder technique exploiting the overlap between objects for which you can have indication from parallax and cepheids or cepheids and supernovae. And they get this uh, um, measurement of the Hubble uh, rate, which is also with an error bar of the order of percent, and which is, of course, as you know, higher than what is measured by Planck. And this is in particular, the results from the, the group of Adam Reset, which has the smallest error bars in the field. Other groups have some Miller conclusion, uh, not so clear conclusion on, on the tension. The tension is dominated by the measurements from uh, the, the team of Adam Rees. All right. So then, of course, you can discuss about systematics. Do you really believe that there is a tension? If you take the numbers as they are published by the different collaboration, the Hubble tension would be four to five sigma. And you know that is very intriguing that there will be another tension at the level of the measurement of S8 which is a measurement of the amplitude of the matter power spectrum on small scale at a redshift uh, somewhere between zero and one. Okay, so it's even tempting to try if possible to solve the two tensions at the same time. Maybe they are telling us the same thing, but before you should wonder if uh, these tensions could be explained by systematics and it's not my goal to answer. I'm not doing the observations uh, 
uh, or the, the interpretation of the observation myself, what I can just mention very quickly without being an expert, is that from time to time people question the systematics in the direct measurement of the Hubble rate because maybe, because we know that supernovae are anyway not perfect candles, they are standardizable candles, as the experts say, meaning that they don't have always the same relation between the luminosity and the extinction time. So there is an unknown coefficient in front, but we already know that this coefficient depends on the, on the population of supernovae. Of course, the experts are aware of this and they try to see on how many like external parameters this coefficient could depend. And they have a list of known effects that they can correct for. And when there is a new paper saying, oops, maybe we should not believe this observation, usually these papers claim that uh, experts have missed so far one of these dependents that would make uh, that would make the supernovae even less standardizable candles than one what we would expect. So these are very technical issues. Again, I'm not expert on this. I know that there are debates on this, but on the other hand, uh, the observer always look at these claims and say, no, we have taken into account this effect already, or this effect cannot be so large, and they really believe their results. Um, concerning the other anomaly, the one on S8, there are also possible uh, things that you could suspect. Maybe there are problems with uh, uh, photometric redshift errors, since a lot of this data is currently dominated by uh, a photometric measurement of, of the redshift of galaxies. And of course, although I was a member of Planck, I, again, we cannot exclude that there was an issue in the analysis of, of Planck. Although I should stress that really when you, when you feed CMB data, you start from, uh, from scratch, from a model, you build a theory which depends only on the assumption of general relativity and a bit of relativistic hydrodynamics, a bit of QED, all this is simple and robust. You don't have to deal with complicated astrophysical effect. Of course, you have to remove CMB foreground, but uh, Planck is already measuring the CMB in a range where the CMB dominates completely over the foreground, at least for some channels. So if, if you would not even try to remove the foreground from the CMB observation, you would still get the low value of H0 when you assume lambda CDM. Okay, so I think the issue of foreground removal is not so crucial when it comes to indirectly measuring the value of the Hubble constant uh, from CMB data. So I think that uh, this CMB side is really, uh, is really robust. So then if all collaborations have published true results and have correctly accounted for their systematics, it's of course tempting to think if we could explain this tension by adding new ingredients in the lambda CDM model. And maybe we want to play with things like non-standard properties of dark matter, dark energy, modified gravity, primordial magnetic field, something like this. Or maybe as I, I will say at the end, maybe, maybe we have to come back to the uh, founding assumptions of the friedman lemaitre model. All right, so I will try to give an overview on this. Um, but uh, first, let me try to um, mention that many, many models have been proposed for trying to solve the Hubble tension. And there is a very impressive exhaustive review in the paper by Eleonora de Valentino et al. from the beginning of this year. Uh, all these are proposed models that had been proposed in March. So you see that the imagination of cosmologists has been completely uh, um, has been extremely active. For each model, for instance, in this review, you see the prediction for H0 compared to what Planck suggests in the lambda CDM case and what the distance ladder experiment suggests. So this is very interesting. However, you have to be aware of the fact that in a review like this, the authors could not redo the runs by themselves. So they are just quoting the results from each publication. And uh, in each publication, different authors tend to pick up some different data sets or use some different criteria to say whether the tension has been solved or not. So this, this is extremely interesting in order to have a list of the possibilities, but not much um, for comparing how well these different models could or could not solve the Hubble tension. And so to address this issue, we, we worked recently with, uh, with uh, these young collaborators 
Um, we tried to redo all the runs ourselves. Of course, we could not do it for all the models. So we did a selection of 19 models that we hope to be representative of the different ideas that have been tried so far of the main categories. And for each model, we have a common data set. And our baseline data set is just Planck, bioacoustic oscillation data, um, remote supernovae from the Pantheon data, and of course, the shoes data on the direct measurement of H0. So this is Planck and BAO and Pantheon are what people usually quote a conservative data set. Uh, technical remark for those who are expert in this, we treat shoes as a, a not a model dependent measurement of H0, but a direct measurement of the intrinsic magnitude of supernovae, which is supposed to be more robust, less model dependent, and allowing to take into account for the correlation between the information contained in shoes and in the Pantheon supernovae data. All right. Beyond our baseline data set, we also uh, presented some uh, other tests in which we remove Planck and replace it just by very, very robust data from primordial element abundance and nucleosynthesis combined with baryon-acoustic oscillation, or for the Planck skeptical people by a combination of WMAP plus ACT. And we also added extra data sets, uh, like data set on the measurement of redshift space distortion by the BOSS collaboration, cosmic chronometers, or maybe a bit less conservative BAO data from an analysis of Lyman spectra in quasars. And I'm not going to talk about these additional sets tests in the talk today because I don't have so much time. And because anyway, qualitatively, the conclusions are the same in all these cases as when you use just the baseline data set. Okay, next for each of the 19 model and for our baseline data set, we have to quantify the tension between uh, shoes and other data. And there is not a unique way to do it. In fact, you, you could ask different questions which are listed here and the statistician would try to give a different answer to each of these questions. So let me go fast because this is a bit technical. I think we are more interested in looking at the different models and, and the comparison between the models. So the naive way that you would use maybe as a first hint to, to quantify the tension is to try to see what is the measurement of this um, supernova magnitude parameter. So this is a parameter which is measured directly by shoes and indirectly by Planck, BAO, and other supernovae data. You could try to fit your model to all data but shoes. So this D is a notation for our baseline uh, data set. And then you could try to compare what you get for MB with what shoes predict. And then use the rule of thumb that you want to take the difference between the means divided by uh, the root mean square of the errors. Okay, this will tell you how much uh, the, the tension persists in a given model. Um, however, uh, it's a bit naive. For instance, this formula assumes that the distribution for this parameter MB is Gaussian distributed. And in fact, this is really the case. In most models that you would study, the distribution of MB from the baseline data set non Gaussian tails, and this is not accounted by using this formula, which assumes Gaussian tails. So you can try to improve a bit over this and just compute the difference between the minimum chi square that you get when you fit a model to the baseline data set plus shoes, minus the minimum chi square of the fit to the data uh, baseline data alone, minus the minimum chi square for the fit to shoes alone. And this gives you uh, a reasonable answer to the question, how does the addition of shoes to the data set D um, impact? We have some echo, sorry, I will re maybe. That should fix it. Yes. How does the addition of shoes uh, impact the, the fit to the whole data set of uh, a party in, within a, a given model? Actually, these two give exactly the same answer when the two when the two distribution on MB are completely Gaussian. And there is a mathematical proof that the two uh, give you exactly the same information. So these two criteria are almost the same, in fact. But this one can be better generalized to the case when you have a non-Gaussian posterior on the distribution of the magnitude. 
A problem with these two criteria is that you could have the impression that you have reduced your tension a lot with a model which has, in fact, a very, very bad chi-square, which is a very bad to the data. It's very easy to find examples like this. This criteria tells you that maybe the tension has disappeared, but for a model which is a very bad fit. And to answer and understand if this is the case or not, you should use something else. So Bayesian, uh, in, in Bayesian uh, statistics, you would use Bayesian evidence ratio between a given model and lambda CDM, for instance, which would be reference. If you want to avoid calculation of Bayesian evidence ratio, what you can do is compute this AKIK information criteria. It gives you the difference, it's the difference between the minimum chi-square of the extended model minus the one of lambda CDM, plus a penalty factor accounting for the number of extra free parameter in the extended model. So this answers a different question. And probably a, a convenient way to see if a model is a convincing solution to thermal tension or not is to compute all three. And if all three criteria give you very good results, then you feel pretty confident that the model is a convincing solution for a possible explanation of the Hubble tension. So this is what we did. And we did it for our 19 models. I will detail uh, what these acronyms stand for. And for instance, these are the results for the second criteria, criterion and the third criterion. So in this plot, um, if if you are at the bottom of the plot for each model, then the, the tension, the final tension is low. And so you want to be in this magenta region in order to pass our second test. Um, concerning the AKK information criterion, you want to be high in the plot in order to have a model which has a good, which is a good fit to the whole data set. And so you want to be in the upper magenta region. So a good model is a model which is low here and high here and the band model would be high here and low here. So using this, we, uh, we published our paper uh, during the Tokyo Olympic Games. This is why we called it the h not Olympics. And we were able to deliver golden, silver, and bronze medal to a few models. So the silver medals are for the model who pass all three tests with a good threshold. Silver, you only pass two tests. Bronze, you only pass one test. Yes. Per degree of freedom. Can you ask again? Why you don't use chi square per degree of freedom? So the naive thing. Uh, the chi square per degree of freedom is um, would be a way to assess the goodness of fit of a, of a single model independently of, of the rest. And that could be a way to an alternative to the third test. You could just look at the chi square per degree of freedom here. Um, so the advantage of, instead of, of comparing it to the one of lambda CDM is that lambda CDM is known to be a good fit. And the interpretation of the chi-square degree of freedom is always a bit delicate when you are not sure of exactly how much the, your data points are correlated. Then the chi-square per degree of freedom in a simple, uh, um, for a simple data set where you have a collection of independent data points, you know very well what it means. For a complicated experiment like Planck, where the points have some small correlations, it's not a very robust test. And it's more robust to compare your chi-square to a reference chi-square for a model which has been shown to be a good fit. Yeah. All right. So now, uh, from statistics to physics. Um, I didn't recall you how you can probe the Hubble rate with the first category of data, so CMB, baryon acoustic oscillations. So the data which are not based on the measurement of the distance ladder of luminosity distances. So you measure H0 from a standard ruler, which is the sound horizon at the time of uh, photon or baryon decoupling. You have acoustic waves traveling in the early universe uh, until the last scattering surface. At the last scattering surface, there is decoupling. Some points separated by twice the sound horizon at this time carry information from perturbation at the same point, so they should be statistically correlated. So you have a correlation length that you can see by doing a Fourier or a harmonic transformation of a map. 
And so you get uh, a measurement of the angular scale to the sound horizon. And you can get this information from CMB maps or from galaxy maps. And in this case, you measure the baryon acoustic oscillation. It's the same information, except that you see the same sound horizon at different redshift and under very different angular diameter distances. And this is how you get indirectly this low measurement of H when you use lambda CDM framework. So this sound horizon has a known simple analytic expression. It's a ratio of the sound horizon over the angular diameter distance. In both cases, you have integrals over the inverse Hubble rate uh, as a function of redshift. Here, there is a sound horizon, which is very difficult to modify in a given theory. It's very simple quantity. Uh, um, you don't have much uh, lever arm to change this, but you have lever arm to act on h of z, or maybe on the boundary of the integrals. So in the numerator for the sound horizon, you integrate from the redshift of decoupling to infinity, that is in the early universe, and in the denominator from today up to the redshift of your observation, either the CMB, last scattering surface, or the galaxies used to measure the BAOs. So it's an integral over the late universe evolution. So the first idea in order to solve your problem would be to say, okay, I just have an information on the integral of one over H, but not on H today. So I could change H today. I could make H today larger while keeping the same integral by compensating, by lowering H of Z at higher redshift. And then my integral will be the same. I get a larger value of H not today, I'm done. So this is what people try to do with so-called late time solutions. And there were dozens of paper trying these late time solutions. The late time solutions are difficult to uh, achieve because here in this integral, the, the information from the CMB fixed the integral up to 1000, BAOs up to different redshift of order one half, remote supernovae, different redshift of the order of one. And of course, when you know the integral of a function up to many different boundaries. At the end, you know the function itself. So the problem is very constrained and um, it will be difficult to solve it. Although you could think of tuning the components which are important at, in the late cosmological evolution, dark energy or dark matter, in order to get a solution to the problem. So people came with model of dark energy uh, and found that for instance, you need something which behaves like phantom dark energy. So with a W smaller than one. A priori, this is problematic. It's a violation of the weak energy condition. However, it doesn't need to be a fundamental uh, model of phantom dark energy. It could be something behaving effectively like phantom dark energy. And like, for instance, dark energy being created by the decay of dark matter. So there have been many papers along this direction. Or otherwise, people have suggested that maybe dark matter is decaying at relatively late time into dark radiation. And all this could uh, lead to the correct behavior for H of Z. Um, now, many authors recently have claimed that when you combine all CMB, BAO, remote supernova data and shoes, the problem is over constrained, it doesn't work. And this is also what we found in our analysis. We tried many models in this category and they were all strongly excluded. They were in fact the worst category of models that we tried. Then um, what else can one do? You could think that we could play with this boundary of the integral, which is a redshift of uh, photon or baryon decoupling. Um, if, for instance, if decoupling is postponed, ZD will be smaller, your integral will run over a larger range. And to compensate for this, you will have to increase um, H of Z. So this would go in the right direction. It's not obvious to do because uh, for this, you have to change the physics of photon decoupling, which itself is controlled by the physics of the recombination of atoms in the early universe. And this is very standard, very well known, very well modeled. Uh, it depends on simple physics, like the, the model for the hydrogen atoms with its excitation levels and some fundamental constants. And um, you will need to, if you don't change these things, you get a definite prediction for the temperature of the, the decoupling. And then by comparing with the CMB temperature today, you get a very, a very robust prediction for the redshift of decoupling and you don't have this freedom. 
So what people have thought about is a first way in which you assume a variation of fundamental constant that could be motivated by um, theories with a very large scalar field that could have a, a very slow drift. And then models of um, modified gravity with scalar tensor theories or models with extra dimensions, string theories, and even beyond. Uh, you have dilaton field. And when these dilaton fields have, a, have a, a very slow drift, many fundamental constants in the standard model have also a drift. And you could think that the, the ratio between the different masses of particles in the standard model change very, very slowly with time. And with cosmology, it's difficult to probe because we don't have an LHC at a redshift of 1,000. But what we would see, uh, among others, would be, for instance, uh, a drift in the ratio of the electron to proton mass, because this is one of the few mass ratios that we can probe with cosmology. And this would be a way to sh change the value of the redshift of decoupling. Another way would be to assume that you have large homogeneities in the cosmological model, but on very small scale. So you don't change anything to the scales that you observe in the city, but you go to smaller scales and you think of a mechanism that would produce very large fluctuations there, not like in lambda CDM. This is relatively um, doable if you involve, for instance, primordial magnetic fields produced during inflation or, or after. And then you, recombination is uh, not described as in the lambda CDM model. You have to go to inhomogeneous recombination models, which are nonlinear. And then what we would perceive as being the time of recombination would be an average over many Hubble patches of the local times of recombination. And due to the nonlinear physics involved, um, this average recombination time could be easily delayed with respect to the prediction of the standard model. So we tried models in both categories, we, uh, inspired by, uh, very closely by the work of previous people. And these models work very well. We could give a golden medal to a model of varying uh, electron mass and a bronze medal to a model of inhomogeneous recombination. It passed, this one passed all three tests easily. So potentially it's a convincing solution. Of course, you can believe or not in this varying fundamental constant. You can think that this is a very far-fetched model, but from a phenomenological point of view, that's a possible solution. Okay. There, are, there is another family of solution, and to understand it, you have to remember that we have three main components in the evolution of the universe, dominating the, the Hubble array one after each other, and that um, the observations, in particular of CMB or large-scale structure or bioacoustic oscillation, are mainly sensitive to ratios between densities. Like, for instance, ratio between the non-relativistic and relativistic matter density, which gives a redshift of equality, or the same for the equality between uh, lambda and uh, non-relativistic matter. And indeed, you can tweak your expression of the sound horizon uh, angular scale in order to have explicitly only ratio appearings as coefficients. Once you are aware of this, you realize that maybe a good idea is to rescale all densities equally the one of radiation, of matter, and of, of lambda, exactly the same factor. Since the ratios will be preserved, theta will be preserved, but in this transformation, you do increase the expansion rate today, which gives you the Hubble rate. So that would be another solution. And this is what we classify as early time solutions. How can you do it? Well, it's very easy to increase the density of lambda and matter because there are uh, three parameters for this in the lambda CDM model, but there are no three parameters for this in the, for radiation, unless you allow the effective neutrino number to vary. And then you realize that you can solve the Hubble rate by increasing all three species by the same amount, such that N effective would increase from about three to about four. As you know, there are issues with this. If you increase N effective to four, you have a problem with nucleosynthesis and the measurement of primordial element abundances. So you already know that it will work if only if you increase N effective after the time of nucleosynthesis, between nucleosynthesis and CMB decoupling. Moreover, there are incompatibilities between the CMB and matter power spectra that you get in a model with a large NF compared to the data. There are problems with the scale of the CMB peaks, with the amplitude of the tail of the CMB spectrum, 
and also with the amplitude of the small scale power matter power spectrum. So it has to do with the way in which, uh, so uh, if you increase N effective, of course I didn't say, but it means that you suppose that there is some extra light relics in the universe or for some dark radiation, or that the abundance of active neutrinos is larger than expected. These additional relic will cluster in some way and also will propagate in some way. And the propagation properties and the clustering properties of this extra light or massless relic have problematic effects on the spectrum, full spectrum shape of the CMB and the power spectrum, such that a simple extension of lambda CDM with a free number of uh, 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 effective number of neutrinos does fail. And so in order to solve this, you may hope to play with new physics in the dark sector. In particular, non-standard interactions, decays, decay rates. And this has a potential to work because for instance, if you change the velocity at which um, sound propagates in the dark radiation fluid or just at which the light relic propagate, you will change a little bit the scale of the CMB peaks uh, potentially in a good way. And you can have also um, different clustering rates of your uh, extra relics that will make the CMB spectrum more compatible with the data, even if you increase N effective. So this is again technical and I am happy to go into the details if, if you ask me later, but let me list a few categories of models that have been investigated. So first people assume that N effective increases not due to extra free streaming relics, decoupled relics, but self-interacting dark radiation. That's very, inter that's very interesting properties. You can get a better fit to the CMB data, even if you increase N effective significantly. And in fact, this simple model got a bronze medal in our analysis. Now, interestingly, yesterday, a group um, has elaborated on this idea and they come back to the reason for which dark radiation could be self-interacting. Of course, you need to build a model for the self-interaction. Their model, inspired a bit by supersymmetry, assumed that the self-interaction between dark fermions, light or massless dark fermions, is mediated by a scalar field with a mass of uh, uh, in the range of the electron volt, such that at high redshift, the self-interaction is efficient. At low redshift, it's inefficient and the particles free stream. And if the transition time is somewhere around 10 to the four, then this model would solve the problems um, of the lambda CDM plus NF model even better than a model in which dark radiation is self-interacting at all times. These people followed exactly our uh, proposal for the different metrics to evaluate the Hubble tension. And according to their results, uh, they should have a golden middle. So uh, if we have the opportunity to revise our paper, this would be a golden middle. Okay, ID number two, dark radiation could scatter on dark matter. Yes. Dark radiation uh, in the end, and effective is how much? And effective um, would be increased by, I don't know the exact number, mm -hmm. but the order of magnitude would be something like 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. And this is excluded for free streaming relics, but you can save these values with the self interaction. Oh, really? Okay. Because so, to, to get a Hubble rate of 74, you would need to increase an effective to about 1.2, uh, 4.2, sorry, from 3 to 4.2. Uh, you cannot go all the way to 4.2 here, but you can go all the way to 3.6, 3.7. This is enough to bring the Hubble value around 71, 72, at, uh, which is acceptable from the point of view of the direct measurements. Okay. okay. ID number two. So I was saying this uh, scattering rate between dark radiation and dark matter. Um, a few years ago, we thought uh, that this model could solve simultaneously the Hubble with the S8 tension. It has very nice properties and it can be motivated with a realistic particle physics model. Now it appears that this model is still very good at solving the S8 tension, but is a bit short of solving the Hubble tension. It didn't get a medal at all. However, it's the only model in the list of models that I will show today, which, all, which can solve the S8 model. 
And there is a remark in the Aloni et al. paper that if they add this scattering rate to their self-interacting dark matter, making the dark sector a bit more complicated, but still, in my opinion, not crazy at all, then they can solve the two tensions. So maybe these two ingredients should be considered together. Then you can think of uh, normal, ordinary free streaming dark radiation, but non-standard interaction in the neutrino sector. And there was a talk on this last week by Thais Brinkman. And Thais and other people, and also in our analysis, we all agree to say that this model was very promising uh, until a year and a half or two years ago, but is now strongly excluded by polarization data from Planck, and also by direct constraints from the laboratory. So it doesn't work anymore. You will need non-standard interaction in the neutrino sector that are excluded both by cosmology and by laboratory experiments. So you could think of other construction of a subtle dark sector model that would achieve these, uh, all what we want, uh, the right position of the CMB peak, the right shape for the spectra, and these people have also been, uh, Miguel Escudero and Sam Witty have been very good in finding a model that has also the properties that you would like. Their uh, idea is a particular implementation of the Majoron scenario in which the neutrinos get a mass from a Higgs-like mechanism. And then the Majoron is a, is a pseudo uh, Goldstone boson of the broken U1 symmetry, gets a mass also, and if this mass is in the order of, uh, in the EV range, these people have shown that lots of interesting things happen. Like when you approach the time of CMB decoupling, the temperature of the universe is comparable to the mass of the Majoron, and the Majoron will thermalize, increasing and effective. And also this mechanism will make the neutrinos, the active neutrinos effectively coupled and once you couple uh, light species together, you have a prediction for the CMB peak, even if you increase NF. And then after some point, the majoron will decay back into active neutrinos that will precipitate. So what is nice about this model is that it's identical to lambda CDM at high redshift. Uh, there is no modification at high redshift, in particular at BBN. So you have problem with BBN constraints. Then for a while, you increase N effective, and then you go back to a model very similar to Lambda CDM. That's very clever, and it helps to pass all the constraints. And this model in our analysis also gets um, uh, a medal. I think it's, I forgot to write it here, but I think it was, ah yeah, it's a silver medal according to our criteria. How much time do I have? Uh, very little. So I will go super fast on the next slide which says that instead of playing with an effective, you do what cosmologists do when they are desperate. You add a, a new scalar field to add a new problem. And this gives a model of uh, early dark energy in which early dark energy is a degree of freedom that will help you to increase an effective for a little while around the time of CMB decoupling, but not before and not after. So the phenomenology of these models is a bit similar to those of the previous pages, but instead of playing with physics in a dark sector and the Lagrangian describing the dark sector and, and the, the dark relics and the dark forces, etc., you play with the potential of a scalar field, a bit like for inflation or quintessence models. And also there, I will go very fast, but you, you get solutions that work very well. And we tried three models in this category. They all got a silver medal. So you could object that this is very ad hoc, but the people who like these models protest that their models make definite prediction that can be tested in the future, can be connected maybe with action models. There, is, there are even proposals to connect it to the Xenon one ton anomaly, just in order to try to make the model a bit more predictive. And you can also motivate this by saying that the scalar field you need is in fact the scalar field of the scalar tensor theory of modified gravity, like this uh, accounted by this Lagrangian. Since modified gravity is always a bit more constrained than um, dark energy solutions, this is a way to present the same in a slightly more better packaged way, maybe. All right, conclusions. In terms of model building, you see that if you want to solve the Hubble tension without destroying the rest, you have to pay a very high price. So maybe you think that all these models are crazy. Uh, fine for me, it's true that no simple ingredient, at least until now, 
seems to work. You have to pay this high price. It shows, however, how cosmology is mature. Uh, if we had a, had a problem like this uh, 10 years ago, uh, there would have been an infinity of, <laughs> infinity of solutions. Now, because the data is so, con so constraining, finding a solution is really difficult. But this has also, this tells us something about the progress done in cosmology. And so you may hope that instead the solution will be solved by some systematics and we will have ways to know in the future because we will measure the Hubble rate with completely independent techniques. And finally, if the tension does not come from systematics, but is true. The previous model have something nice. They can be, they make definite prediction. They can be differentiated by future generation of CMB and large scale structure experiments. Even early dark energy model, Majoron model, or this model with a, with a dark radiation self interaction, they, they make different CMB predictions, for instance, on, on small scales for polarization, etc. And maybe with these models, we will learn a bit about some new particle physics, hopefully. That, and we could then think of tests in the laboratory. Maybe this is very idea, idealistic, but there is a hope. And finally, one way which has not been explored so much so far, because it's technically very difficult to do, is could we solve instead these tensions by going beyond the Friedman model and relaxing the usual assumption of um, homogeneity and isotropy? So this assumption is very well established. People have worked on local voids, and they have seen that even an extreme local void would not save, solve the Hubble tension. I still believe that there is a category of models that could be investigated better, in which you have very small departure from homogeneity on very large scales. There are some hints in the literature that maybe you need models. I don't think they are conclusive, but if you open this box, you can still have a lot of new work to do. It's technically difficult because the problem becomes nonlinear even on very large scales, but maybe this is another way to explore for uh, interesting solutions to the Hubble tension. Thank you very much. So any questions? So if I understood correctly, you make a classification of the models, but I didn't get by how much is the tension reduced in yes. the gold medal. Very good, very good. So um, it's not enough to have different tests. You must also fix a threshold for each test saying, if I'm above, I pass, otherwise I fail. And this is completely arbitrary, of course. Um, what we did is again, a completely arbitrary choice is to say, what mo which model reduce the tension from the four to five sigma model to something below the three sigma level? And why three and not two sigma? Well, we wanted to be conservative and to say maybe, uh, maybe some of the problem will come from systematics. Maybe the systematics will be revised. The error bars from shoes will increase a little bit. And so if we would throw uh, away now models that bring uh, 2.9 sigma tension, uh, we might regret it later, okay? So this arbitrarily is three sigma level. And so when I say that the model passes all tests, it means that with all tests, it's, uh, the tension is below the three sigma level. And uh, another question, it's a bit more difficult. So if, if you were to include a craziness penalty mm -hmm. from your own point of view, do you think this, uh, Podium will be yeah, the same. I don't know how to not? do this better than by considering the number of free parameters. If you go beyond this, you become completely subjective. You know, there will be, depending on what people have worked on before, they will find that uh, uh, scalar fields are more natural, dark sector is more natural, varying fundamental constant is more natural. So we didn't go beyond this. And I would, I would not take the risk uh, myself to go beyond this. But it's a good question, of course. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, I had a question uh, concerning your last point there, going beyond uh, yes. Friedman. Uh, uh, can you maybe briefly mention to us why, why this would um, sort of circumvent the difficulty you mentioned in the fact that you, we have probes at different redshift and low redshift, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, in some sense, we have measured an yeah. effective uh, Hubble. Uh, yeah. So very good. Yeah, how, how do you go around? So let me take the example of 
paper here, I didn't give the full reference, but it's a very intriguing paper. The general idea is that maybe the CMB's last scattering surface is overall very homogeneous thanks to inflation. But later on, a phase transition introduced a small degree of inhomogeneity such that uh, physics is different in different patches in the universe, but very big patches, such that our whole observable universe would contain order of 10 to 50 patches. And in each patch, you could have different values of omega b or other parameters. So these people have tried a very fascinating exercise of fitting the lambda CDM parameters to independent region of the same Planck map. And what is very intriguing is that they find a coherent patterns. A priori, the exercise could return a completely different answer in each pixel with no visible pattern, but they find big regions across which the cosmological parameters of the lambda CDM model are approximately the same. So maybe there is no reasonable model behind. Maybe it's just an indication of something we don't understand. But in this case, it would mean that Planck sees and measures parameters which are a bit fake, which are an average for the patches, while all the data we have on small scale are only concerning our patch. And I don't think that this has been really investigated because it is very difficult to do it. You have to come with a model, compute the CMB spectrum in each patch, and then the average, etc. So it's very difficult to probe. But conceptually, it seems to me that um it it could say that the hubble radius is uh, very large locally not at the scale of a small void but of a huge huge patch and the cmb which tests an even bigger region um, measures an, an average between different hubble values and that could be different from the one in our patch but it's complete speculation okay Coming back to the previous question about uh, the level of reduction in the tension. So if no model goes better than three sigma, yeah. and some of them are very complicated, yeah. doesn't this suggest uh, clearly that the problem is with the data or the analysis of the data? This is a hope. But <laughs> until you have not found the failure in the data, you have to consider all possibilities. At the end, this is this is my bet. Okay, that it's a, it's a problem with the data. But as a theorist, what can can we do except from looking for solutions? Moreover, um, models with a golden medal re do reduce the tension to about two sigma. The model from the paper of yesterday, which is 2.3, 2.4 sigma. So that's significant. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you didn't really comment on this too much, uh, probably intentionally, but could you remark about the other um, measurements of the Hubble tension that are local? So the, the, the status of the, the lensing measurements? Yes. Tip so of the Red the, Giant and maybe other ones that have existed since I paid attention? Yeah. I only mentioned the, um, the data which, which has a smaller stereo bar because it's the data from which the tension really arises. Okay. So for our quantification of tensions, it made sense to focus on this one, of course. There is a, the measurement from um, uh, time delays in, in quasar and strong lensing. And experts regularly talk about possible systematics in the modeling of the strong lensing effect in a given system and argue that maybe this is not very robust. I'm not expert enough to, to uh, conclude on this. And then there is a measurement of uh, the Hubble tension from the tip of the ray giant by the, the group of Wendy Friedman which as you know, find a mean value, which is lower, uh, which is larger. So I think that um, if we didn't have the shoes data, we would not believe in the tension enough to do a work like this. Okay, so that's why we focused on this data set, yeah. Okay, there are no more questions. Let's thanks Julian again and move on to the next one.